Hey guys, Kenna here. So today we're going to be looking at oceans and ocean pollution. Up to this point, we've been mostly looking at rivers, lakes, streams, as far as surface water is concerned, and then looking at groundwater. Now, oceans, remember, are going to be slightly different because they're saline, uh, they have salt in them. And so the composition of the organisms that live there is different, but they still are at threat for a lot of the similar uh, things that we saw when we were looking at freshwater in general. Um, and so keep that in mind as we go ahead and go through as we look at oceans and ocean pollution. Let's take a look at our essential questions. Number one, what does we all live downstream mean and how does it relate to oceans? Number two, where does most ocean pollution originate? Number three, what is a dead zone and what causes it? And number four, what are the effects of oil pollution on ocean ecosystems and wildlife? Now, as I mentioned before we started here, there are differences between the types of water. And regardless of which type you're dealing with, water is essential to life. And it appears all across our globe in many different forms. Fresh or salty, partly or completely surrounded by land, long and narrow, wide and round. You can't put too fine a point on it, but water is crucial. Okay. So... To help you grasp better how all of them work and what all the different types of water are, um, I think it's a good idea for us to kind of go over the different types of water. So let's take a look at those. So this is on oceans, so let's start there. Oceans are the largest bodies of water and they cover more than two thirds of the Earth's surface. An ocean is a vast body of salt water that surrounds a continent. That's compared to a sea, which is also a body of salt water partly or completely surrounded by land and often connected to the ocean. Seas are typically smaller than oceans. Now let's look a little bit more at those things that we've already looked at before. So rivers. A river is a large flowing body of water that empties into a sea or an ocean. Streams, creeks, brooks are smaller tributaries of a river. A lake, unlike a river which is narrow and flowing pretty quickly, is a large body of water that is surrounded on all sides by land. Lakes are generally larger and deeper than ponds. Ponds, also surrounded on all sides by land, are typically smaller than a lake. Many lakes and ponds are actually human-made. A lagoon is a shallow body of salt or brackish water along a coastal area. It is usually separated from the deeper sea by a shallow or exposed barrier beach area. A cove is a small circular oval inlet along a coastal area, often with a protected entrance. The water is partly enclosed by land formed by soft rock. As opposed to a fjord, a fjord is a sea inlet characterized by long, narrow cliffs bordering on either side. A channel is a body of water that connects two larger bodies of water and is often used for transportation and navigational purposes. A bay is a body of water partly enclosed by land and typically smaller than a gulf. Bays generally have a calmer water than the surrounding sea areas because they are protected by the land. Now, regardless of which of these types of water we're dealing with, there are some major water pollution problems that we need to deal with, especially affecting oceans. The great majority of ocean pollution actually comes from the land and it includes oil and other toxic chemicals and solid wastes, which threaten aquatic species and other wildlife and disrupt marine ecosystems. The key to protecting the oceans is to produce the flow of pollutants from land and air to sea, because they typically will end up in streams and end up flowing into these waters. So the areas that are most at risk are going to be those coastal areas. These are highly productive ecosystems, and it turns out that these are also very desired lands for humans, as they are occupied by 40% of the world population. It is estimated that coastal populations will double by the year 2050, and this becomes increasingly important as we start looking at limitations in freshwater and the increase of potentially using desalination. About 80% of marine pollution, however, originates on land. And so we have a lot of different problems that we're dealing with because so many people live next to these oceans, things like ocean dumping controversies. One of the places we went when we went down to the Redwoods this past summer was we took a look at uh, Glass Beach. 
Now, Glass Beach in Fort Bragg is only there because when there were earthquakes, rather than trying to repair or clean up the debris, they just pushed the houses off into the ocean. And so over the years, the glass has worn down and become the little pebbles that make up the quote-unquote sand of the beach. So uh, algal blooms are a problem. We'll talk about this, especially within the, the Gulf of Mexico here in a little bit. And this can lead to oxygen depleted zones, although depending on chemicals and pH, you can get oxygen depleted zones in other areas as well. So if we go ahead and take a look at this, these are a lot of the sources of you know, pollution that we start looking at that are problematic. Industry is a big one. Nitrous, oxis, nitrous oxides from automobiles, smokestacks, toxic chemicals, heavy metals, are going to flow into bays and estuaries and end up in the oceans. Cities, toxic metals and oil from streets and parking lots pollute waters, sewage adds nitrogen and phosphorus, potentially adding biological pollution. Urban sprawl, all the suburbs, bacteria and viruses from sewer and septic tanks contaminate shellfish beds and closed beaches. Runoff and fertilizer from lawns adds nitrogen and phosphorus. Construction sites where new homes are going in or new buildings for business have sediments that get washed away into waterways. This can choke fish and plants, clouding waters and turbidity, uh, blocks out sunlight, and then you get a decreased amount of plant growth, or at least desired plant growth. One of the biggest ones, and I, we can't overlook this, we really need to address this issue, is farms. Runoffs of pesticides, manure, and fertilizer add huge amounts of toxin and excess nitrogen and phosphorus into the waters. And a lot of this ends up in streams that run through seas and into oceans. So these types of toxins can either stay in the water and produce things like red tides, okay, huge growths of algae, poisoning fish and other marine mammals, or we can end up with toxic sediments chemicals and toxic medicals that contaminate shellfish beds, killing spawning fish, and accumulate in the tissues of bottom feeders. Both of these can create areas of oxygen depleted zones. Either sedimentation or algae overgrowth reduces the amount of sunlight that gets to an area that kills beneficial sea grasses and kelp, uses up all the oxygen, and ends up degrading the habitat. So those healthier areas are farther and farther away from shoreline, and we have to be careful about protecting those particular areas. So <clears throat> when we go ahead and start looking at this, ocean pollution is a growing problem, and unfortunately, it's fairly poorly understood. In 2006, the State of the Marine Environment statement was looking at the fact that 80% of marine pollution originates on land, which most people were not aware of. And a lot of this has to do with things like sewage. Coastal areas are obviously the most effective because they have large populations. And we start looking at places like China where those coastlines end up being completely choked out with algae. In deeper ocean waters, even though it's further away from shore and there's less of the large problems that we're dealing with nearer in, you still have diluted pollution. It's been dispersed. And degraded, but the overall health of these waters in general, because of our ocean gyres, is in decline. Okay. This is because the ocean often gets treated as a dump. Many people treat the oceans as a dumping site. 80% of marine pollution originates on land. 80 to 90% of municipal sewage from the coastal areas of less developed countries is dumped straight into the ocean without any treatment. It may be safer to dump waste and degradable pollutants into the deep ocean where it can be diluted and dispersed, but you're still contaminating ocean waters. So when we start looking at these things, we have to think about what kind of contaminants this is going to go ahead and put into the ocean. Now, in raw sewage, we can end up getting viruses. This can come from sewage treatment plants if there's an overflow of the settling ponds or whatever it is. We can get toxic chemicals that are dumped in there. This is what's always in the movies. You can get garbage, sewage, uh, waste oil from cruise ships, nitrites and phosphates uh, from, and sewage from agricultural waste. You know, we talked about those manure lagoons, right? Um, 
when we start looking at pesticides and fertilizer, this is an issue when we start seeing it run downstream into the ocean. Both crude and refined petroleum that's being transported. Uh, you may have heard of some of the oil spills. The Exxon Valdez was a big one when I was a kid. And this can lead to not only problems with the surface organisms that get coated in it, but biomagnified into seabirds that eat fish that got into the oil spills, as well as the urban and industrial runoff as well. So this leads to all sorts of problems in terms of contamination, oxygen depletion, these types of things. And a big example of that would be in the northern Gulf of Mexico. At the mouth of the Mississippi River, you get spring and summer blooms of these huge algal blooms that cause oxygen depletions. This suffocates fish, crabs, shrimp, and has a lot of cultural eutrophication. This is caused primarily by fertilizer used in the Mississippi watershed. So agricultural is one of the biggest polluters that leads to problems in our oceans. So what we really need to focus on is less and more intelligent use of fertilizers and better flood control because floods are making more of this go into the streams or the watershed and it's running it down to the estuaries and into these gulfs. This leads to huge algal blooms, what they call these red tides. Uh, you get these oxygen depleted zones where there's less than two parts per million oxygen available to the fish. Okay. There are preventative measures, less fertilizer, plant strips of forest along the waterways to help absorb some of those chemicals and runoff before they actually get to the waterways, improve flood control so less of this gets into the streams in the first place, and lower car emissions. We put these things into the air, but the air communicates with the water through the water cycle. Okay, and so you end up with putting these airborne toxins and pathogens into the waterways. So here's an image of the Mississippi River Basin, and this you can see the Missouri River, the Ohio River, all of these feed into the Mississippi, and they all dump out through Louisiana's boot, and you end up with this huge tide, red tide area. This is a great example of natural capital degradation. Evidence indicates that it's created mostly by input of nitrates. Uh, plant nutrients from farms is a big part of this. You get some runoff as well from cities, factories, and sewage treatment plants along the basin. The image that you see in the bottom left there is based on satellite imaging and shows the inputs of such nutrients into the Gulf of Mexico during the summer of 2006. In the image, reds and greens represent really high concentrations of phytoplankton and river sediment. And this problem is worsened by the loss of coastal wetlands, which would have at least filtered some of these plant nutrients out. But because we've killed off or hurt so many of these wetland areas, uh, build houses over them, this is a problem for migratory birds as well, but we're focusing on the ocean here. I, I want you to stop and think about how big an issue this is. I mean, look at how much of the United States filters to this one spot in terms of where our water goes. If you could find yourself anywhere along this, the closer you are to the Gulf of Mexico, the further downstream you are from whatever anybody upstream has done. And so I'm asking you, can you think of a product that you use today that was directly connected to this sort of pollution? I mean, what are the things that you flush? What are the things that go down the drain? What are the things that may have gone into a storm drain? We have to think about the decisions we make in terms of what this looks like. Now, this is a drawing, and so I know that may not strike a chord with you, but this is an actual photograph taken from outer space. You can see Houston, Louisiana on there. Okay, The Gulf of Mexico dead zone is an area that's completely hypoxic. Okay? Waters are at the mouth of the Mississippi River, and it varies in size from time of year and different years, 6,000 to 7,000 square miles, okay? It extends westward to the upper coast of Texas, and this is the largest dead zone ever recorded, and that was uh, National Geographic News in August of 2017. This dead zone is the size of New Jersey. That, that's no joke. 
the 2020 Gulf of Mexico hypoxic zone or dead zone um, measured 2,116 square miles. This is the third smallest dead zone in the Gulf since mapping of the zone began in 1985. And this is largely attributed to COVID. Less people getting out, so there's less pollutants, there's less waste. They were manufacturing a little bit less food, less fertilizer, because there wasn't as much availability. But as COVID comes to an end, hopefully you'll think about the fact that this is probably going to balloon back up again. And when you see these dead zones, you see the harmful algal blooms, red, brown, green, toxic tides. This releases waterborne and airborne toxins, which are not safe for human or other animals. It damages fisheries, kills fish-eating birds, reduces tourism, and poisons our seafood. Okay, When this happens, you have about 60,000 Americans that end up with some form of food poisoning. I mean, this is no joke. This is a real problem, both economically and environmentally. If we think about our pillars of sustainability, we talked about at the beginning of the term. Now, this gets less news because it's a recurring thing that happens every single year when compared to, say, an oil spill. Oil spills are a big problem, too. Okay? Crude and refined petroleum is highly disruptive in terms of its pollutants. And if there is a spill, recover is recovery, and that's not full recovery, but recovery to a point of operation is about three years. If you're dealing with refined oil, that can be as long as 10 to 20 years to actually recover from the spill. The largest source of oil pollution in the ocean is from an urban industrial runoff. 37%, that's higher. I mean, the way they talk about oil spills, it's like oil rigs are crashing into things all the time. And believe me, it does happen. But percentage-wise, runoff from urban and industrial areas is actually a bigger portion of it. The other big one is leaks in oil pipelines and oil handling facilities. But when we do have one of these oil spills, it's a big deal. In 1989, this is the one I was telling you that I remember as a kid, uh, the Exxon Valdez oil tanker spilled 40.8 million liters into Prince William Sound. This cost $4 billion to clean up in terms of cost, fines, and damages. And 17 years later, patches of oil were still found. More recently, in 2002, the Prestige oil tanker in near Spain, uh, next two years, leaked twice as much oil. It was a slower leak, but it just kept leaking before they could get it controlled. Here's a picture of the Exxon Valdez. You can see that different color in the water is actually from the oil. And here's a little video dealing with a flashback so you can kind of see what was going on. This should have been the easiest spill in the world to clean up. It's not only the worst oil spill in U.S. history, it's by far the largest in such a remote, pristine area. The tanker, the Exxon Valdez, had just loaded more than a million barrels of Alaskan crude. It was about 25 miles from the Valdez terminal and was apparently trying to dodge ice flows from the nearby Columbia Glacier when it ran aground. I want to assure everyone that Exxon is mobilizing all available resources to mitigate the impact from this incident. Exxon has assumed full financial responsibility for the incident. Exxon has come under heavy criticism for not moving more rapidly to clean up the spill. The crews have not arrived yet to begin cleaning the slime off the island's beaches and rocks. That probably won't happen until next week. Exxon says it cannot do the job in a hasty, haphazard manner. And there's no doubt uh, this is a major tragedy, tragedy both for the environment and for the people up there. Day 10 of the oil spill crisis and the cleanup effort still just beginning. A few crews are on a few beaches removing a little bit of oil. But there are hundreds of miles of affected coastline. 
Exxon, which is running the operation, is coming under heavy criticism from state and federal officials. Where the existing management structure of this cleanup is not adequate to the task, then we're going to do it ourselves, independent of that. State officials in Alaska have made an accounting of what's happened to the spill, now covering an area of over 3,000 square miles. Exxon has had problems not only with its recovery efforts, but also with the continued leakage of oil from its crippled tanker. Officials say a small amount of oil still seeps from the holes in the ship, and containment booms around the vessel are not stopping it completely. This is one of the many small armies Exxon has mobilized to wipe up oil-soaked beaches stone by stone. Jay Hare, president of the National Wildlife Federation, watched the work for a while and yeah, then just call. muttered. I appreciate these folks doing this, but quite frankly, I don't see that it's doing a hell of a lot of good. Hare calls this futile, and he says oil rubbed into the rocks will take longer to evaporate. He intends to push for a new national energy policy, hoping that a national sense of outrage will add to his political muscle. After the Exxon Valdez ran aground, Exxon spent $3.8 billion on cleanup. But the crews only scratched the surface. If you just let the water stand for even just a minute, then the oil blobs will start to show. Still there 21 years after the spill. So as you can see, this is a real issue. Um, and it's not something that just one, went away. We're 21 years out and you're still seeing oil showing up on these beaches that were supposedly clean. Wildlife that was supposed to have been happy and healthy and ready to go again hasn't returned to the Prince William Sound. If you dig into the beach at certain sites around the Sound, it doesn't take long before you get to oil. This photo was taken on Eleanor Island in 2018 and shows just how shallow you have to go before you get to oil. Okay. So what are the effects of these oil pollution in these ocean areas? Uh, the first thing is the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. Um, they kill larvae and other aquatic organisms, destroy natural insulation and buoyancy of both birds and mammals. And in these cold waters, cold climate, that insulation is crucial for the survival of those species. You find tar-like globs on the ocean's surface, which can coat animals. And your heavy oil, which can sink to the bottom, it kills bottom organisms, your bottom feeders, your bottom dwellers. And if it reaches coral reefs, the reefs die. Cleanup methods have largely been based in mechanical cleanup, uh, floating booms, skimmer boats, absorbent devices. But as you watch those videos, our technology has not changed greatly from when that happened for the Exxon Valdez. You're literally out there essentially with paper towels and sponges trying to wipe it off. You know, maybe you've seen a Dawn commercial where they go ahead and use dish soap to try and remove it off of the baby ducks or birds of some sort, okay? Um, the one advance we really have had is they genetically engineered a bacteria that will actually eat the oil and then die. But this is an expensive and it only really works in calmer waters. So the more turbulent the waters are, the less effective that solution is. Current cleanup methods can recover no more than 15% from a spill. 15%. So that means 85% of the oil cannot be recovered. So prevention is far and away the most effective method of dealing with an oil spill. Control the runoff. Build double hulled tankers. So even if the outer hull gets breached, the inner hull still holds the oil ban ocean dumping of any sort of sludge or hazardous dredged waste, regulate coastal development, oil drilling, oil shipping, because this is not going to cut it. This is a scene after the prestige tanker cut in half, spilling more than 70 million liters of oil off the coast of Spain in 2002. It leaked oil from its resting place on the seabed for many, many years to come. Thousands, thousands joined in the cleanup effort, including the soldiers you see here. But 40% of the endangered species, this African penguin included population, uh, are dying. Okay? Um, this was at Cape Town's Table Bay. So huge problem. Here's another one. And this photo taken in 1989. 
A local fisherman inspects a dead California gray whale at the northern shore of Latouche Island in Alaska. Uh, the whale was found in oil-contaminated waters of, you guessed it, Prince William Sound, where we had the Exxon Valdez. After the Deepwater Horizon oil blowout in 2010, rescuers rushed in to save birds like this pelican. But in the end, it didn't really matter because almost every single one of the birds that got coated died. Okay. So what are our solutions? Number one, prevention, prevention, prevention. Reduce our input of toxic pollutants. Separate sewage and storm lines. Don't let the two intermingle. Have protections in place to prevent them from overflowing in some sort of storm surge. Ban dumping of wastes and sewage by ships in coastal waters. Okay. Have you ever think about where all the waste goes, all the pee, all the poop when you go on a cruise ship? They don't store it all on the boat. Banning ocean dumping of sludge and hazardous dredged materials. People seem to think that if they're far enough away from shore, nobody's going to care. It doesn't matter. But remember, everything's connected. And we have to regulate coastal development of oil drilling and oil shipping, requiring double holes for oil tankers. If we do get to another accident or an incident, what do we do for cleanup? We have to improve our oil spill cleanup capabilities. And as of this time, our technology has not improved a whole lot over what we've been using. They're starting to look at nanoparticles on sewage and oil spills to dissolve the oil or sewage, but this is still under development. Those bacteria we talked about still under development and only really functional when we get to these places that are, you know, more calm waters. But if you're near a coastline, those waters are going to have breakers. Require secondary treatment of all coaster sewage, not just one pass, but two passes. Make sure it's clean before it goes into our waterways. Use wetlands, solar, aquatic, and other methods to help treat the sewage, like we talked about in terms of those living sewage treatment plants. So these are those same things we talked about before, and we have to be careful as we go through. Residential areas, factories, and farms all contribute to coastal water and bay pollution. According to the United Nations Environmental Program, coastal water pollution costs the world $16 billion a year. That's more than $30,000 a minute due to ill health and premature death. So at this point, I want you to stop, look at this list, look and think about all the things that are happening in terms of pollution. What are three changes you could make in your lifestyle that might help to prevent some of this pollution? Okay. Think about that for just a second. The last thing I want to talk about is what you're seeing here. Um, our oceans are becoming a dump, a garbage dump. This is one of the many garbage patches that exists around our planet. Basically, any gyre, any circular current pattern that exists in the oceans collects all these plastics and other garbage together. Uh, this picture is actually taken of what's known as the GPGP, or the Great Pacific Garbage Patch which is the biggest of all of the garbage patches, and it sits between California and Hawaii. Um, most of the major oceans, we think about the Pacific and the Atlantic, they actually have two garbage patches, depending on where you're at in the gyre. And there's litter stretched out over miles for these. So I, I want you to go ahead and watch this video and think about the impact that these types of garbage patches have. Plastic pollution is one of the biggest threats the oceans face today. But how much do we really know about it? On its mission to solve this problem, the Ocean Cleanup just published the most advanced research ever on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the largest accumulation zone of ocean plastic on the planet. Scientists have been studying this area since the 1970s, mostly by dragging a small sampling net through the ocean. The Ocean's Cleanup's researchers believe this method was valid only for small debris and covered too small an area to reliably measure larger debris. So, in the summer of 2015, the Ocean Cleanup launched the Mega Expedition, crossing the patch with 30 boats simultaneously. In addition to using many small nets, two giant trawls were towed behind the fleet's mothership. In total, they brought back 1.2 million plastic samples. All were hand-counted, identified, and classified by type and size. 
a monumental task, taking a team of lab technicians two years to complete. However, the largest debris appeared less frequent and more scattered. Quantifying the debris required an area 20 times larger than the mega expedition to be covered, something only possible from the sky. The ocean cleanup ran the first ever aerial surveys of a garbage patch by converting a former military aircraft into a high-tech research platform. Cutting-edge sensors allowed them to reconstruct the 3D shapes of large debris to calculate their mass. The results of all this work? The Great Pacific Garbage Patch measures 1.6 million square kilometers. That is three times the size of France. The patch contains 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic, which equals 250 pieces for every human in the world. The total mass amounts to 80,000 tons, 4 to 16 times more than previous estimates. 92% of this mass is made up of the larger objects, all of which are destined to fragment into dangerous microplastics over the next few decades, if left under the effect of sun and waves. And because the findings show that pollution in the patch is increasing exponentially, the plastic is unlikely to go away by itself. These results paint a new picture of the problem and provide a baseline for the cleanup of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, set to start in 2018. And that cleanup actually did start, and they have been making some progress. But remember, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is one of several. There are two for each of the major gyres, and the smaller ones have a single uh, garbage patch as well. So we have to be really careful when we start thinking about just how much garbage is out there, how much plastic, and along with that plastic, what other pollutants there may be. Okay. All right, guys, that's what I've got for you today. Take care of yourself, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon. So long.